sprayed up here. Okay, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. There is a whole sea of empty seats right in front of me, so if you feel like you're far back and the screens are small, please move up and, and fill in. So um, I've been president of SSA for 28 hours, and I, I, I know my favorite part of the job is that I get to stand up and say nice things about some of my favorite people. And tonight is another opportunity. Um, I think most of you know I'm Sue Huff, the, the current president of SSA, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker, the 2019 joiner lecturer, Robert Graves. Uh, many of you know him, and he, he doesn't need an introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Uh, Rob's main area of study is the analysis, characterization, and simulation of strong earthquake ground motion. He's become one of the foremost leaders in the field of 3D ground motion simulations, hailed for his accomplishment in developing efficient al modeling algorithms that allow for large-scale three-dimensional simulations to be computed on desktop platforms. Many of us in this room, myself included, have benefited and continue to benefit from his expertise, which he has lent to numerous projects uh, for, for the USGS and the Southern California Earthquake Center, including the 3D waveform modeling pro program and the refinement of the SCEC community velocity model. He's one of the founding architects of the SCEC broadband simulation platform and continues to, to update and maintain numerous codes on the platform. He's made many contributions to public safety, um, including various uh, projects for, uh, um, maybe I won't read off the, the whole list, and as well as the NGA uh, projects. He's also a longtime and deeply committed SSA member. Uh, he's published much of his results, much of his results research in SSA journals and further advanced the mission of the SSA with his service to the Board of Directors. We couldn't be more honored and excited to welcome him to the stage this evening. And so please join me in a round of welcoming applause. Thank you very much, Sue. Oh, that's a beautiful picture. Okay, thank you very much, Sue. Well, first things first here. I have to prove to my kids that I was actually here. So everybody, <laughs> smile. Excellent, okay. Now I can say, this is what daddy does at work. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk uh, over the next 45 minutes or so about uh, some aspects of simulating earthquake ground motions. Before I get into the talk, I'd like to offer some acknowledgments. First of all, to SSA, EERI, the Joiner Committee, uh, for presenting me with this award. It's, it's a tremendous honor, uh, and I'm actually quite humbled when I look at the list of previous recipients. Uh, including the namesake for the award, Bill Joyner, who I uh, had the pleasure of knowing and, and working with uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, I'd also like to point out uh, the contributions of some specific inv individuals, uh, starting with Paul Somerville. Uh, Paul is a longtime colleague, collaborator, mentor. I worked with Paul for nearly 20 years, um, starting after graduate school and uh, as a, a consultant. I learned so much from Paul, just immeasurable amounts uh, related to seismology and engineering, and I'm deeply indebted to his contributions to my career. Next, uh, my longtime colleague and collaborator, Arvin Patarka. Arvin and I have worked on ground motion simulation techniques uh, for many, many years. Uh, Arvin and I actually started uh, halfway around the world and working on similar problems, and then we got to work together for a number of years. I've learned a lot about wave propagation and rupture characterization from Arvin. Uh, and then I'd also like to acknowledge contributions uh, to my career from uh, Christine Goulet. Christine and I have worked 
closely, uh, mostly more recently on a number of projects, engineering related projects, both through the Southern California Earthquake Center and also PEER and the NGA program. Um, as many of you know or may not know, Christine's background is in engineering, uh, but she's learned a tremendous amount of seismology. One of Christine's foremost strengths is her ability to communicate across diverse groups and get people to work together. Uh, and I have certainly benefited from that in my work. So thank you to, 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 to those three. Okay, let's get into the meat of it. Uh, here's a brief outline of what I want to talk about. I'm going to begin with some motivation for developing earthquake ground motion simulation methods, why they're important and how we can use them. Uh, and then I want to look at, at actual strong ground motion recordings and what are the features in there and the frequency dependence and how does that relate to the features that we put into the simulations. This will lead into some background discussion of uh, simulation techniques and how we incorporate those features. Um, and then more recent work I want to highlight on how we can improve the simulations by incorporating more realistic scores and media complexity and descriptions. And then I'll summarize at the end with some research directions, areas where I think we need to, to make some improvements uh, as we move forward. Okay, why simulate earthquake ground motions? Well, actually for me, it was very exciting. I remember when I started in graduate school, I thought, wow, this is just fantastic. Who, who else would want, you know, why would you not want to do this? Well, there's some important reasons too. Uh, one is to augment recorded data those areas where we don't have ground motion recordings, and that's typically large magnitudes and at close distance. So we can utilize the simulations to get estimates of what those ground motions might be. Also examining the impacts for scenario earthquakes. We might ask the question, as was done in the 2008 shakeout, what is the ground shaking expected in the Los Angeles region for a large San Andreas rupture? We don't have recorded data for that, but we can simulate it. We'd also like to test parametric sensitivity and with the aim of hopefully constraining or reducing the amount of uncertainty in our ground motion uh, hazard estimates. The question we might ask is how will the ground motion vary at my particular site depending on where the hypocenter location is or what the crustal velocity structure is and how will that impact the ground motions. Finally, um, as scientists, we would like to develop a better understanding of the physical processes. Um, are the physical relations and the parameters that we're using, are they able to provide predictive insight into the expected ground motions in future events? There's tremendous power in that, and being able to develop that is an important part of doing the simulations. So this leads into what I call physics-based earthquake ground motion simulations. Now, physics-based may mean different things to different people. Um, for me, physics-based means that the result is determined by solving a set of physical conditions or equations. For example, the wave equation. Now, we all recognize that all physical mo models have some level of approximation, okay? The more advanced physical models can yield more accurate representation of natural phenomena, but at the expense of expanded parameter space, that's knowledge, and mathematical complexity, so computation. We're always battling these two factors, knowledge limitations, that is what we know and how well we know it, and then computational limitations, the efficiency of the algorithms, the computer speed, the storage requirements, and so forth. So before I get or talk more about the simulations, I want to actually look at ground motions themselves. What controls strong ground motion? At high frequency, oh, and let me know, throughout this talk, I'll refer to high frequency and low frequency. Generally, high frequency in uh, my talk is going to be frequencies above one hertz. Low frequencies will be frequencies less than one hertz. So at high frequencies, uh, ground motions are controlled by earthquake magnitude, the distance from the rupture, and site response. As we get up to the larger magnitude, say magnitudes above seven, it's mainly distance, the magnitude saturation, 
there's magnitude saturation, and that is assuming site class is equal. And I say that this is one reason why the ground motion prediction equations actually work very well for high frequencies. It's very predictable in that sense, at least in terms of the median motions. At low frequencies, things are a little bit more complicated. Obviously, earthquake magnitude, local fault slip, and distance from the fault have a, a role. But the hypocenter location and the radiation pattern and also large-scale geologic features, such as basins, those can all influence low-frequency ground motions. Uh, and as an example of this, you can imagine if you're five kilometers away from a portion of the fault that slips 10 meters, that's quite a different situation than if you're five kilometers away from a portion that slips only one meters at low frequency. And we know large ruptures can have large variability uh, in slip along the fault. And hence, at low frequencies, there's a large variability in the ground motions. So we want to be able to, to, to capture this uh, as best as possible with our simulations. Looking at this in a little bit more detail, if we, uh, the, the plot that I'm showing here on the upper left, it plots uh, peak ground acceleration on the vertical axis against peak ground displacement. And these are values that are taken from the NGA West database. The solid gray circles are far source, that is greater than 10 kilometers away from the fault. The, uh, the open uh, black circles are within 10 kilometers. And you can see that for these near source motions, the ground acceleration saturates, this curve flattens out, whereas the displacements continue to grow. Now, there's a number of reasons why this might occur. Nonlinear effects, both with the source and the site, uh, attenuation effects, geometric spreading. Also, large acceleration does not necessarily come from the same part of the fault as large slip. Looking at this in a slightly different manner in the lower right, uh, I'm plotting just the sites in the near fault region. And this is as a function of magnitude going across the horizontal axis. So the, the, the light gray circles are the peak ground acceleration. You can see above magnitude six, six and a half, it's basically flat. Uh, the median value is about 0.5 G. For the peak ground displacement, the dark, uh, the squares, or I mean, the, excuse me, the X's there, they continue to grow, increasing displacement with increasing uh, magnitude. So we see there's, there's this frequency difference, this frequency dependence. What about radiation pattern? So uh, radiation pattern is one of the most fundamental principles of seismology. The radiation pattern says that the strength of the waves that are radiated from a shear dust location are dependent on the direction relative to the fault, the direction or the azimuth. And it's different for P waves than it is for S waves, as illustrated by these, uh, these schematics here. And that obviously can have an impact on the nature of the ground motions. If we couple the radiation pattern with a propagating fault, a finite fault, then we can have rupture directivity effects. What I'm showing here in a, in a map view is a schematic. We're looking down on a strike slip fault. The epicenter is indicated by the star down at the bottom. The rupture propagates up towards the top of the slide. Uh, typically, the ruptures will propagate at about 80% of the shear wave speed, so just a little bit below the uh, the, the uh, speed that the waves propagate through the Earth. If we look at the SH radiation pattern for this particular case, a vertical strike slip fault, we see that there's a, 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 a maximum that's oriented directly along the, the direction of rupture propagation. So the SH motion as that rupture propagates upwards towards the site up here at the top, it sums coherently. And it sums in a way such that the motion is strongest in the direction perpendicular to the fault, the fault normal component. If we look at the other horizontal component, the orthogonal component, the SV motion, it actually has a node 
located along the fault, as indicated here on the right. So even though there's, in a sense, a, a coherence or a constructive summation, it's summing values which are very small. And so the dynamic motions, in this case, in this idealized case, the dynamic motions parallel to the fault are much smaller than the fault normal motions. Obviously, in this case, we could have a large static displacement, but I'm talking about those dynamic oscillations. Now, this type of, of, uh, of effect has been observed in numerous earthquakes. I want to show an example from the 1979 uh, magnitude 6.5 Imperial Valley earthquake. The map that I'm showing here on the left-hand side, we're looking down on the, the near fault region. The epicenter is located by, or indicated by the green star just south of the international border. The fault ruptured up towards the north northwest is indicated by that red arrow. The solid black lines are places where the, the fault actually broke to the surface. There's mapped fault displacement along there. The triangles here are strong motion recording sites. And the ones that I've highlighted in orange are all within uh, 10 kilometers of the fault. Um, some seismologists or engineers that had tremendous foresight located an array directly across this fault. Tremendous data set uh, resulted from this. It has been analyzed in a number of studies. So I want to look at a, one particular site or a site in particular. This is EC06. It's located just about a kilometer away from the fault. I'm plotting the waveforms here on the right-hand side. So the, the bottom row here are ground velocity. And then the top row is ground acceleration. Uh, on the left column is the fault normal component. And then in the right column is the fault parallel component. So if we look at the ground velocity on the fault normal component, so that's the lower left panel, you see it's dominated by this big pulse of motion. Very coherent, very strong. And it's much larger on the fault normal than it is on the fault parallel, actually about a factor of two larger. This is related to that uh, radiation pattern. The accelerations dominated by higher frequencies, as we would expect, but also we notice that the, the peak motions are about the same on both components. So we see now a hint of this frequency dependence. And just to summarize, this rupture directivity effect leads to these pulse-like motions, or can lead to it on the uh, uh, where we have strong polarization at lower frequencies on the fault normal component. And the higher frequencies uh, don't show very strongly these radiation pattern effects. Now I want to try to quantify that a little bit more as a function of frequency. So looking at the frequency dependence of this. So what I've done, I've taken the, those sites indicated in orange. There's 11 sites there. For each one of those, I compute the ratio of the Fourier amplitude spectra for the fault normal component versus the fault parallel component. And that's done for the 11 sites. That's shown by the 11, uh, excuse me, by the gray lines on this, on this plot, which admittedly is very messy. However, if we average across those 11 sites, we see a very strong systematic pattern. And that's what's shown in red here. So we can see that for the frequencies less than about one hertz, there's a very strong systematic um, uh, increase in amplitude on the fault normal component relative to the fault parallel. For higher frequencies above one hertz, that ratio on the average is centered about unity. So this is a result of what I call the homogenization of those radiation pattern effects as we get to higher frequencies. So what does this mean for simulations? We want, we want to use these features and these data to guide our simulation methods. And this has led naturally into what's called the hybrid simulation method. And this is an approach that's been used for about 20, 25 years. Basically, what's done is the low frequencies are simulated using one approach, and the high frequencies are simulated using a different approach, and then they're combined together. So at low frequencies, generally less than one hertz, uh, 
A complete finite fault rupture description is used of so all the spatial temporal complexity and heterogeneity in the slip distribution. Full theoretical wave propagation Green's functions are used, uh, either for a plane layered structure that is a 1D meteor or even a 3D velocity structure. And this has typically been termed uh, or referred to as a deterministic approach. At high frequencies, uh, slightly different approaches used. Simplified finite fault rupture description. So it might include spatial heterogeneity and slip in terms of high patches or low patches of slip. But the source radiation itself, in terms of the details, has a stochastic phase. And the radiation pattern is just prescribed in an average sense. Green's functions uh, typically are simplified. They might include travel time effects, geometric spreading, uh, attenuation, and impedance. This approach at the high frequencies has traditionally been referred to as a stochastic approach. Uh, now, I do want to point out that both approaches actually utilize and incorporate deterministic and stochastic features. Uh, so this above classification is not strictly correct, but it's been used for many, many years. I will continue to use this in the remainder of the talk, talking about uh, deterministic and stochastic approaches. So let's look in a little bit more detail as uh, you know, what's included here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, deterministic or the physics-based approach at some level, it, it, it involves a direct solution of uh, linear viscoelastic wave equations, which I've written down here. So there's a force balance equation and a stress strain relation. And this can be solved either in a plane layered media, 1D media, using uh, a technique like frequency wave number integration. This is what's done on the SCEC broadband platform. It's restricted to 1D Green's functions. It can also be solved in a fully heat, uh, 3D heterogeneous media using finite difference or finite element, spectral element, and so forth. And that approach has been done for the shakeout exercise, the haywired exercise, and also the SCEC cyber shake exercise. In a, in a sense, that's the easy part. The difficult part is specifying the source, specifying the rupture. So there's two main ways of doing it. One way is to use a kinematic prescription. In that approach, the rupture or the source is prescribed either as body forces, those are the F terms, or as the moment density tensor, this MIJ term. The other approach is a dynamic rupture approach. And that requires solution of additional physical conditions and that determines the spatial temporal evolution of stress change along the, the fault surface, and that's how the rupture propagates. So let me just go into a little bit more detail to make sure that the distinction is clear. Kinematic rupture describes the movement of the fault, but does not directly address the underlying physics. Fault rupture is simply prescribed by the slip time function that occurs at each point on the fault. It's a relatively simple computation relatively few input parameters. However, it's not necessarily to be uh, guaranteed to be physically consistent uh, in terms of the rupture description. The dynamic rupture characterization parameterizes the underlying physical features of the problem. So the state of stress, strength of the rock, frictional properties, etc. And then fault rupture occurs spontaneously as the strength of the rock is surpassed by the imposed stress. It's a relatively complex computation, uh, and a number of the input parameters are not as well constrained. However, it does have the benefit that it relies on the a physical set of relations, and so it is guaranteed to be physically consistent. Now, in the remainder of my presentation, I'm gonna focus on the kinematic description, but I do wanna make sure that people understand there's this distinction between the kinematic and dynamic characterizations. Okay, so restricting to the kinematic representation, we can actually write the deterministic simulation in this form. 
So U here is the ground motion response, and it's basically the convolution of Green's functions with a slip function. That's illustrated schematically here. We have a fault. D is a slip. We convolve that with a Green's function for wave propagation, propagate it to the site, sum them together, and we have our seismogram. Now it turns out that the stochastic simulation utilizes a very similar representation. This is done it typically in the Fourier or uh, frequency domain using a Fourier transform of the ground acceleration waveform. But you can see that there's actually a, a, a strong similarity in terms. We have a Green's function term, a path term, uh, a subfault source amplitude spectrum term. Typically, this is an omega squared term based on the work done by Jim Brune. Uh, but then there's also this last term the W term. Uh, now, W is a complex spectrum of window time series. It has random phase. And this W term is what I refer to as the stochastic part of the stochastic simulation. What I'm plotting here at the bottom, this red uh, waveform here, is actually just a one realization of this W term. And it actually looks kind of like a ground acceleration waveform. So what, is this, what does this term represent? What does the stochastic phasing represent? The approach, the stochastic approach, was designed to match statistical properties of observed high-frequency ground motions using a simple far-field model of the radiated amplitude spectra. As such, there's no explicit slip rate function in the stochastic approach. The random phasing within this term represents unmodeled details of the rupture process and scattering effects along the propagation path. Okay, so now we've done our stochastic deterministic simulations. I'm gonna illustrate this with a quick example. This is a site just a couple kilometers from the San Andreas Fault. So the bottom traces here are deterministic. Uh, left to right is acceleration, velocity, and displacement for a single component. You can see it's dominated by the lower frequencies. The red traces are stochastic results for that same site, dominated obviously by the higher frequencies. So how do we combine those? It's a very simple process actually called match filtering. High pass filter on the high frequencies, low pass filter on the low frequencies, and sum them together. And when you do that, you get the black traces here, the broadband response. And you can see we actually have very rich acceleration, half a G more or less. The velocity has this pulse, but it also has some high frequencies riding on it. And if we integrate up to displacement, we're basically looking at the static displacement for this particular site. Okay, so how can we move forward? How can we improve these approaches? When aspect is to improve the kinematic rupture characterization. Uh, obviously, the best way to do this is to use physics, guidance from rupture dynamics. Another approach was, would be to improve the characterization of the seismic velocity structure, uh, seismic velocity and attenuation structure. And I would say particularly in the upper one to two kilometers of the crust. This is where it's most important, where it affects the ground motion at, at the site. Uh, improved models of nonlinear response is helpful, and this includes both near fault, so in the fault damage zone, and then near surface, which would be the more typical site response um, uh, approach that's been done for many years. Um, and then kind of combining all this together, I think it would, it's desirable to push the deterministic approach to higher frequencies. And the ultimate goal, at least in my perspective, is to eliminate the need for a hybrid approach. And that is develop a unified approach that's applicable to a broad frequency range. And I call this the broadband deterministic simulation. So how do we get there? What features are needed to do this? Well, I think one key is to reduce the coherence of rupture and wave propagation effects in order to better model the higher frequencies as we push to the higher frequencies. So this includes spatial and temporal complexity in the rupture process, 
more accurate representation of the fault surface, heterogeneities in the fault surface, and incorporation of near surface and near fault 3D seismic velocity variations. Okay, so now in the next few sets of slides, I want to step through some examples where we examine the impacts of these features using a suite of simulations for a hypothetical uh, magnitude 6.45 earthquake. This is a very idealized case. I'm looking at a vertical strike slip fault. It's uh, shown schematically in this uh, upper left panel. It's vertical and it's embedded in a plain layered velocity structure. The velocities are uh, hard rock site condition, VS30 of 1100 meters per second. So then I'm not worried about, I'm not caring about site response in this, in this set of si simulations. We're gonna compute results using a finite difference code discretized at 25 meters, so fairly fine. And that allows us to resolve ground motions up to and actually a little bit above five hertz. I'm gonna step through five separate cases, starting with a very simple kinematic rupture and then adding various components of complexity to the rupture and the seismic velocity structure and we'll look at the impacts on the ground motions that result from that. Okay, case one, simple kinematic rupture. Um, the, the panel that I'm showing here in the middle is looking broadside on the fault. This is gonna show an animation of the rupture as it propagates across the fault. The bluish colors will be the slip rate where the fault is slipping, and then it'll fill in behind that with the orange colors. That's the static displacement following that. So you see this narrow band of slip that progresses across the fault. It takes about 10 seconds to get across the entire fault. Constant slip fills in behind it. If we look more closely at the slip, slipping part of this, what I'm plotting in the upper right here is a slip rate function shown in red. It is a very rapid rise in the beginning, goes up to the peak value, peak slip uh, rate, and then it has this longer tail behind it. And this is a function that's actually designed based on examining dynamic ruptures. So this is where the guidance from the dynamic ruptures is helping with the kinematics. Um, there's a parameter, rise time, slip rise time. That refers to the total duration of the slip rate function. And that's the time that at any one point on the fault, it's actually slipping. The total duration of the rupture, as I mentioned, is about 10 seconds. The slip rate, uh, uh, the rise time, is on the order of a second or less. So it's much shorter the amount of time that a single point is slipping. So now I want to look at the ground motions that result from this case. So um, I have a panel or a series of panels here. I'm going to run an animation. Let me explain what's on here. In the upper left, it's going to show the rupture, the rupture that I just showed, so you can see in real time what's happening there. The bottom panel is looking at a perspective view of the ground surface um, for this particular model. So we have a fault trace in the middle. The green star there is the uh, epicenter. And then there's a blue square uh, down on the lower right. And that indicates the site where we're gonna see the ground motion waveforms actually play out. And those will play out in the upper right panels. So ground acceleration along the top row, ground velocity along the bottom row. Again, left column is fault normal, right column is fault parallel. So let's start this thing up. The rupture is now progressing across the fault. We see the ground motions impact the, the, at the surface. It's actually a very smooth, very simple, although very jittery display, not planned, um, a, as we might expect from this simple, simple uh, parameterization. If we look at the waveforms, uh, we'll start with the ground velocity on fault normal. We see there's a, a big pulse there, or a couple of pulses, kind of, kind of uh, uh, idealized much larger motions on fault normal than fault parallel. Same is true with the acceleration, we, where it's dominated by a couple of spikes, much larger on fault normal than fault parallel. Not really realistic, but uh, helps to give us a, a baseline here for this very simple case. So now let's start adding complexity. Case two, heterogeneous slip. So to generate the, uh, a heterogeneous slip distribution, we begin with a uniform case, 
And then we apply wave number filters that have random phase, and these follow rules describing the wave number to k, generally k to the minus 2, and they have magnitude-dependent correlation links. When we do this, the result uh, for one realization is shown here on the bottom right. So the, the red patches, the hot colors are high slip, and then the, the light or white colors are, are low slip. So now let's put that into our simulation. Uh, everything else is still going to be the same. So the rupture is now propagating out. You see it encounters these high and low slip patches, and that actually is adding some complexity into the radiated waves. We're now seeing uh, bursts of energy as these uh, small asperities pop off here and there, and it gives rise to a fair amount more complexity in the resulting waveforms that are shown in the upper right. So instead of just uh, one or two pulses, we have now a whole series of pulses. Uh, however, we're still very much dominated by the motions on the fault normal component, even at the high frequencies. So case three, uh, moving in onto some more uh, complexity, temporal rupture perturbations. So this is rise time and the rupture speed. So starting with the rise time, how do we generate variations there? Well, well in the initial case, we begin with a depth-dependent background rise time, and it, the average of that matches what's given by the Somerville relation shown here. We also include a depth dependence due to the shallow weak zone. So in the upper five kilometers, we actually have longer rise times, and that's indicated here in the upper right where the slip rate function is spread out. So it has a lower peak slip rate because it's stretched out. On the deeper part of the fault, we have shorter rise times. So the same amount of slip actually occurs in a shorter amount of time, excuse me, gives rise to a larger peak slip rate. We then apply perturbations to this. Now these perturbations are partially correlated with slip, and this adds complexity to the rise time distribution, and then hence the slip rate distribution across the fault surface. So a realization of that is now shown on the lower right panel um, based on the perturbations. What about uh, the rupture speed? So again, we start out with a very kind of simple parameterization. Background rupture time is computed using a uniform rupture speed. It's scaled to the local shear wave speed. We also include, again, a depth dependence. So this is due to the shallow weak zone in the upper five kilometers. And that's such that in the shallow part of the fault, as indicated here, the rupture speed scales at about 50% of the local shear wave speed. On the deeper part of the fault, we have a fa faster rupture speed. It scales about 75 to 80%. Now the black contours on this plot are indicating one second intervals of the rupture as it propagates across. So it's still a very smooth distribution. Now to that distribution, we apply perturbations to the rupture time, and this adds complexity in the rupture propagation, and it effectively accelerates and decelerates the rupture on relatively short length scales, and this breaks down the coherence of the radiated energy, particularly at the higher frequencies. So you can see the, the nice smooth contours are now become kind of ragged, places where the rupture jumps out ahead, places where it's delayed. So now let's look at the ground motions uh, that result when we include these, these additional complexities. So again, we'll start the rupture. You'll notice that the rupture now, instead of progressing smoothly, it kind of evolves and jumps across the fault surface. The ground motions as seen in the lower panel become quite, quite a bit more complicated. So now we're getting a whole series of bursts of energy. It's not only related to the slip distribution, but also places where the, accel or the rupture accelerates, decelerates. Anytime that change happens, it, uh, it, 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 it uh, radiates high frequency energy. Um, this is evident, obviously, in the ground motions that we see uh, uh, plotted in the upper right. We're now actually, we've kind of extended the durations of shaking. We have a whole series of arrivals, not only in the ground velocity, but also in the acceleration. 
Um, these are starting to look more like realistic seismograms, at least in a qualitative sense. However, um, we're still having very strong polarization on the fault normal component compared to the fault parallel. Okay, so the next step, case four, geometrically complex faults. If we look back at, at recent earthquakes, we can see that uh, you know, the faulting occurs in a very complicated manner. This is an example from the uh, 1992 Landers earthquake. What I'm plotting here, the black traces, those are all the surface traces where some amount of displacement was measured out in the field. And you can see that there's numerous subparallel fault strands. If we restrict ourselves to where the largest offsets occurred, we still see that there's this kind of geometrically complex set of segments. The same is true for the um, 1999 Hector Mine earthquake, it occurred about 20 kilometers to the east, and um, with, a, with a similar kind of uh, uh, array of, of complicated segments. And there's numerous other examples of this. What I showed earlier about the Imperial Valley case, these black traces indicate a, a fair amount of complexity. So how do we handle this? How do we generate the fault roughness? The fault roughness is generated um, in, in my parameterization using perturbations to the planar fault surface. And these follow a self-similar fractal distribution across a pre prescribed set of wave numbers. The main parameter, the roughness parameter, called alpha, controls the perturbation amplitude, such that the, the RMS deviation or perturbation is proportional to the fault length, the uh, L given here. So shown on the, on the uh, right side here, our fault is 20 kilometers long, alpha is 0 0.01, so that means our RMS values are about 200 meters. The maximum values get up near 800 meters. What's shown in this plot, it's kind of a plot of topography on the fault surface. So the reds are coming out, out of the plane, coming out towards you, the blues are going back into the plane. Also, you can see in the upper left, shown in perspective view, is this rough fault, same, same fault plotted at a one-to-one at a -one scale. Now, these perturbations change the local strike and dip of the fault surface, and that affects the radiation pattern, particularly at the higher frequencies. And so this can have a dramatic impact on the radiated ground motions. I will note here in what I'm doing, I do not consider the dynamic effects of this, which may or can be very important, such as you know, the stress changes as the orientation changes. What I'm doing now is only looking at the uh, um, kinematic representation. Okay, so let's run this again. The rupture itself is basically the same, but now it's occurring on a geometrically complex fault. And you can see now there's some asymmetries on the, uh, either side of the fault. The ground motions are uh, more complicated. We're actually now starting to see some more polarization onto the other components. These seismograms are actually looking fairly realistic. The, so the, the changes in the geometry and the radiation pattern are now having an impact uh, particularly at the higher frequencies. Okay, so the last case I want to consider has to do with the uh, changes or uh, perturbations to the seismic velocity structure. The first case is 3D correlated or random correlated seismic velocity perturbations. So we start with our plane layered structure. On the upper left, I have indicated a profile AA prime. That's shown in cross section on the upper right the plane layered structure with our, uh, our rough fault going down in the middle. Generate depth dependent stochastic perturbations. They have a power spectra following a von Karman correlation function. Apply those to the background velocity structure and the result is shown in the lower right. The standard deviation in this case is about 2% in the deeper model, ranging up to 10% in the upper part, so it's stronger near, in the near surface. And then the correlation lengths, the horizontal lengths, are much larger than the vertical. So this gives rise to lens-like perturbation structures, which is 
uh, similar to what's seen in, in real geologic profiles. The second component here is a fault damage zone. So the near surface of many faults exhibit a damage zone that consists of multiple subparallel fault splays or mechanically weakened rock. And a schematic of that is shown in the upper right panel. The damage zone widths can vary from less than a meter to over a kilometer, and they can actually extend down to about five kilometers or more. Typically, these zones are characterized by relatively low seismic velocity, and that can trap and amplify ground motions. The, the profile on the, on the bottom right shows a section across one of these damage zones, and you can see within the damage zone, you have an amplification of the, of the seismic waves. Uh, due to the lower velocities. So to model this, we go back, we begin with our perturbed velocity structure, and then we apply a damage zone centered along the fault. In this case, it's characterized by a maximum 30% reduction in seismic velocity. It uh, about a, a kilometer and a half centered on the fault and extends down to about six kilometers in depth. Now the velocity reduction tapers from the edges towards the middle. So there's no sharp contrast here. It's very gradational as it goes across that zone. Okay, so now we, uh, let's incorporate those two features. These are going into the seismic velocity model. Our rupture is the same as before. But you'll notice as the ground motions propagate along the fault, there's also there's this channeling or trapping along the fault itself. And then also a tremendous amount of distortion of the wave field as the waves propagate away. They're encountering these, these perturbations. So the, the waves become broken up, uh, a lot of asymmetry, and a lot of um, uh, secondary and tertiary arrivals are created. If we now look at the waveforms that result from this, we see, again, if we start with the fault normal on the ground velocity, we see a nice pulse of motion there um, with a, a fairly hefty peak amplitude. It's about a factor of two larger than what we see in the fault parallel for ground velocity. And yet the accelerations now on both components look fairly similar. We have about the, roughly the same amplitude. If I want to go back and revisit uh, the frequency dependence. What I'm plotting here is the results from that Imperial Valley study. The, the gray line here, that was the red line from the previous plot. I'm doing the same type of analysis with the simulated data. So I compute the ratio of the Fourier amplitude spectra, fault normal to fault parallel, and I average over a number of sites in the near fault region. First case here, um, very simple uh, situation as expected. We have a very strong fault normal to fault parallel ratio across all frequencies. Case two, we're beginning to add in some complexity. Case three, not only slip, but also the time. Case four, now we have the roughness on the fault. And then case five, with the, the situation with the velocity perturbations. And you can see as we add in this complexity, at the higher frequencies, we're now starting to break down the coherence in that radiation pattern. So this addition of complexity in the rupture process, uh, fault geometry and seismic velocity structure starts to bring the simulation into close agreement with the observations. So where do we go from here? What are the areas where we need to improve our knowledge base? Uh, large magnitude scaling relations, nonlinearity at the source, rupture process and rupture parameter space, and the seismic velocity structure. I want to go through each of these in a little bit more detail just to, in the last minute or two of, of the talk. So magnitude area scaling. Um, for magnitudes above seven, the choice of the scaling relation has significant impact on the implied average slip. The plot I'm showing here I obtained from Brad Agard. Uh, it shows average slip on the vertical axis and moment magnitude on the horizontal axis for three recent magnitude uh, scaling relations. And you can see as you get above magnitude seven, these relations begin to diverge. The root of this is um, something that Hanks and Bakken termed the no high stress drops, no deep slip enigma. And what that means is that 
the ground motions for the largest events don't really support unusually high stress drops. At the same time, the crustal seismogenic thickness is typically about 15 kilometers. Does not suggest that ruptures are penetrating, these very large ruptures are penetrating deep into the crust. So how is this additional moment release accommodated? Uh, there's a variety of choices. I'm just going to list a couple here. Very long rise times, possibly. Uh, maybe off-fault damage can accommodate some of that. Maybe there's other reasons. We haven't seen it. But this is a key component or a key issue that needs to be addressed because these are the events which may, in many cases determine or control the hazard and have the most risk in terms of the impacts. Near source nonlinearity. Okay, I talked about um, fault damage zone. Our current kinematic implementation, we reduce the rupture speed and extend the rise time in the upper five kilometers. We can also reduce the seismic velocity and increase attenuation in this damage zone. But this mechanically weakened rock likely responds nonlinearly non under very high strain in these large magnitude earthquakes. And this has been examined in some, some very recent studies. Um, and these studies have shown that the off-fault plasticity can actually reduce, have a noticeable reduction in the amplitudes of both high and low frequency motions. And it may, in fact, even create some dynamic feedback with a rupture process. So we need to develop a better understanding of this physical behavior, along with the parameters that describe the rock rheology and state of stress in the upper crust. Uh, OK, another topic, super shear rupture. Uh, what do I mean by that? What happens when the rupture propagates faster than the local shear wave speed? And this has been observed and documented in a couple recent earthquakes. Here's an example for the uh, pump station 10 recording for the Denali earthquake, 2002. It's pretty clear there was a sustained super shear rupture near this site. And what happens in that case is that you get a very strong component or a very strong arrival polarized on the fault parallel component, shown in the top trace here. That's labeled A. The fault normal motions also get a, a super shear pulse labeled B, but not necessarily at the same amplitude. You may also get a K, uh, uh, an arrival labeled C, a sub shear pulse. This may be uh, akin to the typical rupture directivity pulse that I talked about before. But obviously, this case is very much different from the idealized cases I have been talking about before. So how often does this occur? Is it related to simple fault geometry? What is the role of rock rheology in the state of stress? And can it be parameterized in a probabilistic sense? Does it occur 5% of the time, 50% of the time, 80% of the time? Um, I, I, I think these are important questions that we need to answer in order to be able to incorporate this uh, uh, more robustly in our, ha our hazard calculations. Okay, the next topic, high frequency radiation. Does high frequency radiation come from the same part of the fault as large slip? Well, recent analyses of large magnitude subduction events suggest that there's a spatial separation. The plots I'm showing here are from work done by Art Frankel on the Male Chile event. The left panel shows a, what's called the background slip, the shallow slip, very large slip on the shallow part of the subduction zone controlling the low frequency radiation. The deep part of the fall is controlled by these high stress drop sub events. That's where the high frequency ground motions come from. So does a similar separation or some type of separation occur for crustal earthquakes? We don't really know because we don't have quite the same level of resolution for crustal earthquakes as we do for subduction earthquakes. Now it's possible that back projection imaging may help with this in terms of delineating those, where those uh, areas are. But we'd also like to know what are the rheologic or dynamic factors that suppress high frequency radiation along certain parts of the fault. The last item here is characterizing the 3D to seismic velocity structure, and in particular, how can we improve the resolution in the upper one to two kilometers? Now, there's some very recent exciting work that's been done using um, 
dense receiver arrays. I'm showing a couple of examples here. The top is from a Long Beach array, and then the bottom is a case on the San Jacinto fault zone. And these arrays, arrays are able to image structures down at the meter level and in the upper kilometer or two of the crust. So very detailed representation of the seismic velocity structure. Now this is very attractive and it's desirable to utilize this type of information, move away from the stochastic representation, but how practical are these types of deployments? Can they be done on a large scale, like across the entire Los Angeles basin? And then how, how would we integrate these into our existing 3, 3D uh, CVMs? And maybe there's other ways to image these structures that are not, not quite as demanding from a resource standpoint. Okay, so the closing summary. Um, Physics-based ground motion or earthquake ground motion simulations need to account for some key features in the near fault region. It's large variability of low frequency motions, the saturation of high frequency motions for large magnitude, and the homogenization of the radiation pattern as we get to higher frequencies. The traditional approach to do this, to incorporate these effects, is a hybrid method where the deterministic and stochastic simulations are computed separately. Recent developments, not only work that I've done, but other groups are working on this, to extend the deterministic approach to higher frequencies. And in order to do this, it requires increased spatial and temporal complexity in the rupture process, and incorporation of uh, realistic near surface and near fall 3D seismic velocity variations. And this is where we need some continued research. Earthquake scaling relations, rupture processes and parameter space, and improved characterization of the near surface uh, seismic and attenuation structure. Uh, my last slide here, I would like to just acknowledge some simulation resources. One is a SCEC broadband simulation platform, which I've been heavily involved in. The website is located here. You can actually download software to compute ground motion simulations in plain layered media. There's multiple algorithms, multiple regions are covered. There's documentation, testing, verification, uh, and validation included. The second one is the SCEC CyberShake platform located at this website. Physics-based 3D simulations with finite fault rupture descriptions to compute deterministic and probabilistic seismic hazard in California. Very recently, these results have been merged with empirical estimates to develop MCER design spectra for the Los Angeles region. This is part of the UGMS project, which is headed by C.B. Kraus. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much for your attention. So what do I do? So, um, I think we can take a few questions if people have burning questions. Or, or there's wine and beer. <laughs> tough, tough choice. Um, I'm happy to answer questions over wine and beer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a couple of okay. reminders, and, and they're a little bit important. One is that there is wine and beer, but the reception is split between two different rooms, the ballroom next door, as well as the Grand Crescent, which is across the room, so do, don't all go in one direction. Um, yeah, that'll be bad. The other two reminders are that, is that there's a um, special interest group in this, on the CC array, in the Cascade Ballroom 2 on the second floor, that's 8 to 9.30. And the Women in Seismology reception is 7.30 to 9 in the Cascade Ballroom 1. Um, yeah, also on the second floor. Thank you.